Um, so uh, this is wonderful to get a chance to just have a few minutes of reflection. Um, and um, I will definitely end on time. Um, so one of the one of the probably best opportunities is to reflect a little bit on uh, how things have changed over the course of these um, wonderful events. And uh, in particular, are we maturing as a field? Um, I was a developmentalist, as most of you are in one way or another. And so it's a good uh, check. Are we actually maturing as a field? And so I wanted to reflect on that mostly today. Um, and Alyssa uh, had some quotes about that UDL is um, in some ways perpetually in a uh, nascent uh, infancy stage. Um, and uh, will we ever be out of that? And in some ways, as Jamie just said, we want to be very careful that we never become a fully matured thing. Um, I'm sorry, I, I have a chest cold, so it's, my voice isn't so great. Um, but uh, I, I did wear this just as a joke in some ways, but I think we'll be UDL novices forever, and that the minute someone says, I know UDL or I do UDL, then you need to question whether they really know what they're talking about, because I think it will always be uh, something that is uh, growing and, mat and the maturity will come uh, after our lifetimes, uh, so we're on a uh, you know the journey. All those metaphors, um, but I wanted to report on uh, some pockets of maturity, not not senility, but where things are looking um, like there um, there are pockets of maturity in this developmental field. Um, so my favorite of the whole time was my visit to. Um, and Bill, now I forgot to remember the name of the school in Montgomery County that I was at. Uh, Great, Great, Seneca Great Seneca Creek Elementary. And the teachers here, I think they actually have real jobs. Oh, there's one of the teachers I visited. <laughs> <clears throat> I should have you do this instead of me. Um, and well, they would be embarrassed to think of themselves as a mature UDL school probably. Um, what I saw were things that looked mature and that they were uh, no longer focused on choices, for example, or multiple representations or things on the guidelines simply. They were meta. They'd gone to a second level of having the kids be incredibly reflective about those choices. Now, I want to point out two things about it. First of all, if there weren't choices, and they would do exactly the same thing, so they're working on, uh, in one of the classrooms, they're working on multiplying by fractions. And the things that they would do would have immediate choices. Do you want to do it with graphics? Do you want to do it with a line thing? Do you want to do it with numbers? How do you want to do it? And everything looked like that. There was choices everywhere. And that, I think a lot of people think, well, that's UDL, providing choices. But actually, that's an immature UDL. What I thought was beautiful at your school was that it was an intentional, intentional reflective practice that involved the kids as much as the teachers. What's working for you? Did that, that you chose to do it that way, did that work? Talk to your peer. Your, they were partnered up and talk to your partner. What worked for you? What was a good approach for you? And so the kids were so uh, so capable at self-reflection that I thought, okay, this is what we're looking for. What we wanted as a school is very self-reflective kids who are able to make great choices about how they learn, what's the best way for them to learn, about what the best way for someone to teach them. And that these kids are gonna be consumers of education in ways that we want and ultimately the expert learners were really going. So I saw kids who were in the second grade who were more experts at learning um, than I've seen adults be. Because I heard them say things like, I don't use the diagram so well. You know, I, I like it when I use the number line better, whatever. These are second graders kind of talking in this way and you think, okay, we're not going back from this. This is 
uh, this is a future that we had hoped for. So it was fabulous to see it in practice. It was just a wonderful uh, uh, school visit. And I, I, I want to say also, I just was at a talk um, uh, from Bartholomew, uh, Caitlin, and are you here, Caitlin? And see, they cut out because they knew I was going to talk. What? Oh, they had a flight. Okay, so I can say anything I want. <laughs> <coughs> um, so anyway, also a pocket of maturity where um, their whole school system, as I think a lot of you know, has become very self-reflective about its own processes. UDL's baked into everything they do, but they measure. Are they doing good UDL? And when they adopt a new program, they look to see, will this fit into our overall UDL approach? And then they have rubrics on virtually everything to say, are we doing it? Are we getting better? Are we getting smarter? So in Bartholomew, I saw also a mature pocket of maturity where um, it wasn't just doing UDL, but it was UDL in a self-reflective, progressive, always learning fashion that both of those instances for me were where they do have expert learners, people who are learning all the time. That's the point. It's not that you get something, but that you're on a continual learning and you're, to do that, you reflect, you measure. All of those things need to happen. Um, so it was just wonderful for me. It would have been enough for the trip just to see those two things, see schools where it looked great. I wanted to uh, talk about uh, Alyssa's talk. Is Alyssa here? She thought she was being, uh, she had a flight, <laughs> so I can, sp I can speak freely again. Okay, well, that didn't, wasn't her talk annoying? No, no, <laughs> um, no she was worried it was, and I thought it, um, I thought it was great. And um, I wanted to just hit on the simple versus complex thing, because she was annoyed and used a, one of the phrases from somebody writing about it that, uh, I think, oh, I think it was Dave Eddyburn's article, you know, that actually it's pretty complex. Um, and I think it's, it's important that we say, yep, you know what, it is more like rocket science than it is like plug and play. Um, that doing UDL, good, doing good teaching, is actually pretty complicated business. And I don't think we should hide that. And I think we should agree that that's the case. But I wanted to go back to what something just that I thought was so remarkable um, at uh, the Montgomery School, which was we had teachers come and talk to us at the end, and there was a couple of new teachers. They've had some teachers who had just really been doing UDL for a long time. And someone asked one of the new teachers, well, how did you get trained to do this? So you'd obviously really impressed. And how did you get trained? And she, and she revealed that she'd never heard of UDL in any of her teacher prep programs, um, and that she'd never read anything about UDL or anything like that. Um, and, you know, professional development happens one hour a month or stuff. It's not like there's a lot there. And so it was almost what was, I thought, a wonderful moment for me was watching her try to figure out, how, does, how do I know how to do this? It was almost like she had to pause. And what she then said was, it's such a culture here of doing UDL that you can't not do it. It's just part of the way everybody teaches, and I guess you just absorb it. Um, but I like the idea that it's the culture itself that is now mature as a UDL culture, so that you join a culture who does these practices, and it just happens in the hall, and it happens when you're having lunch, and it happens when you're having conferences about a kid, that you find out everybody's doing this. And uh, again, there was no sort of explicitness to it, because the culture was so strong. So I wanted to go back to Alyssa's point and say, I, you're all UDL people, that actually, whether something's complex or simple, is entirely determined by context. And you all know that. You know, playing high-level NBA basketball is really complicated for you and I. It's very simple for an NBA player. And, but one of the things is how does the context support? So in that school system, the context carries so much of the cognitive and emotional load of UDL that it seems simple to that teacher. And that was what was 
all in her face was like, I don't know how you could not teach like this. So instead of seeing it as complicated, she saw it as simple, which I thought was beautiful. And it was largely simple because she lived in a culture that was complex and rich and gave her the support she needed to grow and be able to teach like that. So that was a real, another, for me, moment of seeing a pocket of maturity. Um, the, how am I doing? Okay, only nine minutes. Um, the other, another topic I wanted to um, talk about is sort of amongst us, what's the maturity look like? And um, I, think, I think some of you have heard me talk about um, uh, Bloom that did Bloom's Taxonomy. He has another book on the development of, of talent. Um, it's, I actually think it's better than the taxonomy book. It's a wonderful book about how do you get extreme talent in people, people who become virtuoso violinists or athletes or something. And he talks about um, that everybody needs three kinds of teachers. And I apologize for those of you who had heard me do this before. Um, the first teacher is, and he's talking about the emotional aspects of teaching. The first teacher is all about providing an emotionally safe and welcoming environment for whatever you're going to learn. So you remember your first teacher in something. They're, wow, Davey, you're so good. That's amazing. You can play two notes now. And we're going to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And Oh, it's so wonderful by the way you played that. And OK. And that first teacher is, in fact, providing an emotional foundation that says, I can play music. I'm OK, and I'm good. And then a second, he talks about a second kind of teacher, which everybody needs if they're going to get to real expertise. The second teacher is all about technique. All right, they're no longer just about providing this emotional foundation that makes you feel like I could be a musician. It's like, OK, you're going to have to practice to be a good musician. And that one does the stickers on your things and gets you in a band and does all those things to provide the sustained engagement. You, I think you can see I'm following the guidelines here. But um, the sustained engagement requires real practitioner uh, be able to do that. And that's why you join bands and you have uh, stickers and awards and all kinds of things like that. And um, uh, to support you, because it's hard to sustain practice and effort. And, um, and I usually tell the story by telling about my own learning to play trumpet. And I went through these two stages, had a really wonderfully welcoming first teacher, and the second teacher was usual teacher. I got to be technically a good trumpet player. And then I went to, uh, I was in Miami, Florida, big band kind of town, and um, my high school went up against all the other high schools, and I was the solo first trumpet. And we got our review, and we lost. We lost terribly. And the judges read the why our band lost, and they said the solo trumpet was not musical. So that was me. You can imagine, as a high school kid, to be singled out as the reason your high school, it wasn't the only reason, but one of the reasons your high school band was not good enough was the solo trumpet player wasn't good enough. And I was devastated, of course. You know, I couldn't face my girlfriend. And um, my band leader was a good teacher, and he said, David, we need to talk to the judge. Um, and he brought me right over to talk to the judge. And he said, uh, you know, Mr. Judge, this is David. He's our solo trumpet. And you gave him a pretty harsh criticism there and uh, just wondered what do you think should happen. And he said, he needs a new teacher. And of course, my, my band guy was my teacher, so that didn't feel good to him either. <laughs> it's like, you're not a good enough teacher. So they, my band guy said, well, who should he get? And he gave a name and so on. We, so then we went to my new band, te my new trumpet teacher, a whole nother town, way, long way, way, more expensive, everything. And then the first moment, and I apologize, I didn't realize I was going to do this part, but uh, so I go in uh, for my first time with this new guy. And he says, okay, play me something. So I played my best piece. And he said, and I remember these words, 
absolutely every single word is the exact word. He said, do you play anything well? Okay, so this is a long way from that first teacher who two notes were great to after, you know, now I've been playing trumpet eight years, do you play anything well? And I'm like, holy cow. And then he basically said, look, go home, practice up, I'll give you one more chance. Piece has to be twice as fast and twice as good. And then I'll consider whether I take you. And I'm like, I have to, I'm paying you, you the money. <laughs> I don't know what is this. But anyway, that was the kind of teacher that Bloom talks about you needed for your last teacher, which is incredibly demanding. And he in fact calls it the, uh, what's the word I usually use, Tracy? Um, the, uh, um, louder tyrant and think of all the ballerinas and all the athletes and whatever their last teacher their most teacher is a tyrant they're demanding they're not saying oh you're great you're great they're saying that isn't the way Beethoven meant that to be played and that high note was flat and so on they're incredibly demanding and that what we need as teachers is to get every kid to finally have a tyrant teacher who says you know what you're good enough that I can be demanding and you've got a resilient emotional tone from all these years, and now we can be demanding. You can't start there. You can't even do that as the second teacher. It's only because I was really pretty good already that I could have someone that says it's not good enough yet. Um, and that becomes a process of self-reflection, that he wanted me to become aware that I was not playing well enough, and did I want to get better? And what was neat is right after that first time he talks to me I go home and I'm furious I'm angry and I didn't practice that night but the next night I practiced for an hour which was longer than usual the next night I practiced for two hours the next night I practiced for three hours because I was damned if he was gonna be able to reject me uh, and I came back played the piece twice as fast not twice as good but I didn't know what that meant yet but anyway and he as I c I can't remember him ever saying good that was good David he would say something like let's try something new that was the best compliment I ever got in three years of practice but he got to me to be a very very good self-reflective trumpet player I would come in he'd say David what well, how do you think it is and I'd say I don't think I have it yet and that's what he wanted was someone who was demanding about myself so sorry long dog a pony show I only have two minutes but I want to say that I like it uh, that the, um, look, Susan's taking pictures of those guys, and I'm going to compliment Susan and these people first. You can't do it right now. That I like it that this, the group who runs this have brought in people to be challenging and to be self-reflective. And I like it that last year's Deep did that really well, said, you know what, David, your stuff isn't good enough. And I like, so as a matter of maturity, we need to be at conferences where some people are getting a ton of support for just being here, and some people are getting, you know what, that wasn't a very good talk. And you know what, UDL's not very far along yet. It's really still in its infancy stages. And I like it that this conference is brave enough to say, you know what, we're not good enough yet. We aren't measuring ourselves well we aren't doing good UDL research we're not good enough and that to me is a mark of a maturing field it's not a shaky field it was shaky in the first year when everybody just said good things to each other we were just happy there was 40 people here and now we can be self-critical but I see that as a very strong sign of a maturing field that there are people who are willing to criticize each other I just had a wonderful session with Jason where we we're just getting into a wonderful argument that we need another hour for and I thought okay now we're getting somewhere we're getting to be a mature field um, and in my last 25 seconds uh, what's next I think that we need to make that explicit and expose it that we are mature enough to be self-reflective and self-critical because we want to be experts at this and one of the things I really want to have as a as a journal uh, some, somehow we need to get a journal. But I was thinking about it for the first time tonight. This came to me how I'd want to structure a journal. 
and it would be that we need to do two things in the journal. The, always the journal would have two sections. One section is um, research worth practicing. So the researchers have a place to publish their research, hardcore, really good research, not fake research, but with the idea that it should lead to practice. And saying research worth practicing says, what we publish are research that has consequences that should be, uh, should evolve into practice as opposed to research that nobody cares about. So research worth practicing. But then the whole second section of each journal and each article should be practice worth researching. And that we should have it be written by teachers who are implementing and saying, I tried something, it was really good, and I did my data collection, and now I'm hoping I can be a serious researcher or work with serious researchers, because this is a practice that needs researching so it can go to scale. So I'm hoping that all of you will want to publish it in such a journal, we'll have to find somebody to support it, whatever, but a journal that has two parts. How can we do research worth practicing and how can we do practices worth researching and then we'll be a mature field. Anyway, thank you so much for having uh, this moment with me. And I just